Good morning. And welcome to Calvary Church, where we exist to reflect the love of Jesus in the world. I'm going to just maybe stand over here for a second. Um, my name is Matthew Hochalter. I serve Calvary as the pastor of leadership and care. So glad to see you this morning and want to say that if you're visiting with us, we would love for you to fill out a Connect card that you can find in the seats around you and exchange that for a small gift after the worship service at the Welcome Center in the lobby. And for the rest of you, just a handful of invitations um, in the coming weeks and days. For the next three Wednesdays, we'll be hosting the Women's If Gathering. So we'd love for you to participate in that in the next three Wednesdays. You can find out more by checking your bulletin that you can get at the Welcome Center or finding out more online. Please do register for that at calvaryholland.com slash register. And then another one for newcomers among us, if you're interested in exploring more and hearing more about Calvary, then we would love for you to come to our next newcomers gathering on April 28th. We'll have lunch together and get to hear more about Calvary's story, get to know one another a little bit more, and uh, take first steps towards becoming members at Calvary. So we would love for you to go there and uh, do register for that at calvaryholland.com slash register. Now, would you stand and join me in hearing God's word from Psalm 57? God invites us into this place this morning. We believe that nobody is here by accident and we're invited with these words from scripture. Awake my soul. Awake harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples for great is your love. It reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the skies. So be exalted, O oh God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Well, let's sing to this resurrected King of ours, King Jesus, this morning. In Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today.
Christ has led.
be seated. Would you join me in prayer? God, we praise you. We praise you for who you are and for what you have done. that we would never grow tired of praising you. That we would never grow bored of that story. That we would never grow apathetic to this good news. But that we might praise you. in all that we do, in all that we say, because you are so worthy of all of our praise. So God, we praise you this morning, in this Easter tide season where we celebrate the resurrection. where we lean into all that that means for us. When we lean into all that that means for the entire creation. That your light that burst from the grave continues to chase the darkness in our lives and in our world. And that the darkness cannot and will not overcome your light. So God, as we continue to praise you this morning, would you by your spirit mold us, shape us, fashion us, refine us, empower us, lead us, guide us to rightly praise you in all that we do and say. We love you, God. Come have your way this morning. All these things we pray for your glory, for the joy of your people, in the good of those who don't yet know you, and all God's people said together, amen and amen. Well, As we continue in worship, we have the opportunity to give of our gifts and our offerings. So those who are coming forward to collect the offering this morning, you are welcome to do so at this time. The funds that are given for the offering go directly to Calvary Church's general fund to support the ministries of Calvary Church and our mission partners, both globally and locally. So we appreciate your generous giving and contributions. And... Starting this morning, we're going to sort of pilot and introduce another um, movement of worship where we get to give testimony and share stories to the work that God is doing in us and through us and among us, either God's ordinary work or God's extraordinary work. And in order to do that, I've got a couple stories prepared this morning, but what we want to do is not just curate stories from staff or from leadership that we maybe know about and can share about ourselves, but there are QR codes around the worship center by the doors, um, and we would love for you to scan those QR codes to be able to share your story. Again, both the ordinary and the extraordinary work that you see God doing in you, through you, and among you. Um, And it's just a wonderful opportunity for us to give God the praise that he is due for his goodness and faithfulness among us. So the story this morning that I would like to share is just a recap of last week. Last week was Holy Week, and um, we had the opportunity to have a community prayer room, but that week culminated in a Good Friday service where six worshiping communities worship together here. And it was a beautiful time, and not just a nod to the unity of the church, but an actualization of the unity of the church. 
it wasn't just different worshiping communities coming together because it was convenient and there would be small crowds because it was spring break, but it was actually the six communities saying, we want to take Jesus seriously. When he said in John 16, it is my prayer that you will be one. And it is by this that the world will know that you are my disciples. So that oneness is our witness. And then on Saturday, we had the opportunity to welcome a handful of neighbors to our Easter egg hunt on Saturday morning and a beautiful time of fellowship and community and conversation as we uh, just opened our doors and said, welcome, come on in. Um, even though it was raining, we did have the opportunity to hang out in the smaller spaces of the lodge, but a beautiful time there. And a story that I would like to share just kind of from my family from that time is we may or may not have come to the Easter egg hunt about 10 minutes late, um, which isn't an unordinary thing for us as a family of seven. Um, and I was kind of thinking that, you know what, this is going to be okay, we're going to come. And we walked in and we're greeted with a shocked look on Jessica Van Rees' face. And she said, Pastor Matthew, I'm so sorry, all of the eggs are gone. We're 10 minutes into the Easter egg hunt and the Easter eggs are gone. And my five kids um, didn't have any Easter eggs. And so I thought, well, this is probably a good lesson for them to learn. Like a good lesson about, you know, responsibility and consequences and things like that, that we as parents oftentimes <laughs> struggle to teach our kids. Um, but soon after we were greeted at the door, we were greeted by one of our middle school students who said, hey, I, I'm going to go and rehide my eggs for your kids. And then she was followed by a handful of other middle school students who did the same. And so instead of the lesson of responsibility and consequences that I thought my kids were going to learn, they maybe learned a better lesson about grace and about compassion. And then on Sunday, we gathered together for our Resurrection Sunday service and celebrated the grace and compassion of the cross and the victory over sin and death that the resurrection proclaims. And it was a beautiful, beautiful time together. So praise God for that story. Another story that happened uh, this week, in, in, it actually starts in November that an individual of our community came into our offices just looking for a little bit of help, a gas card to help him get to Grand Rapids to visit his wife who was in the hospital, and we, we were able to meet that need. And I know that Jason and Deline, our mission staff, they prayed over this individual, and he was so thankful for their prayers and their support and, of course, for that gas card. Well, fast forward to just last week. The offices were pretty uh, sparse and empty with spring break. People were out of the office, and this individual came back into the office looking for some help again, a little bit of financial assistance, because his work boots were falling apart, and he needed to get new work boots. He knew that he had work boots set aside for him at the Gateway store. They were 25 bucks, but he didn't have the money to get these work boots. And so, unfortunately, because of our mission staff being out of the office in that day, Jeff Benson, our facilities director, was the only one there to greet him. And he said, I, 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 all I can do is pass this along, but in addition to that, can I pray for you? And so Jeff Benson, our facilities director, prayed for this individual. And again, he was deeply blessed by those prayers and by that support. A couple days later, Jason Pierce, our missions director, was able to meet with the individual at the Gateway store, buy him the boots, and listen again to his story. His wife has since passed away. Doesn't have a lot of people to go to. And so not only meeting the need of the work boots through 25 bucks, but lending a listening ear and a shoulder to cry on. And that's what it looks like to reflect the love of Jesus in the world. So we would love to hear the stories of what God is doing in you, through you, and among you in both ordinary and extraordinary ways. So we would love for you to scan the QR codes by the exits of the worship center. Now you've probably been wondering, when are the kids going to go upstairs? Now is that time. Preschool age kids, you are welcome to head to the back. Parents, please do register them and pick them up upstairs after the worship service.
And now, everybody else, would you stand up and let's take a couple of minutes to just fellowship with one another, say good morning to each other, maybe go grab a cup of coffee, whatever you would like to do. Good morning. Good morning. If we haven't met, my name is Kelly Tenhaken. I'm the Director of Prayer and Spiritual Life at this place, and it is just a joy to be with you this morning. I want to start off by going to God in a word of prayer. Can you pray with me? Creator God, who formed humanity from dust, breathe in us again this morning. Revive us and sanctify us by the power of your spirit. Set our hearts on fire this morning with the good news of your gospel. Amen. We celebrated Easter last Sunday, but Easter is not just one holy day. It is a holy season. According to the church calendar, The joy, beauty, and mystery of Easter cannot be contained in a single celebratory morning, but rather, Easter spills over into 50 days, seven weeks. We need weeks, not just one day, to comprehend the implications of the resurrection, to sit in the wonder of the empty tomb, to allow our eyes, ears, hearts, minds, and souls to be reoriented around the fact that Jesus of Nazareth died and then came back to life. So for today and the next couple of weeks, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to look at three post-resurrection appearances of Jesus in the Gospel of John. So as to help us discern and decipher where the risen Jesus is, what he's up to, and what he's inviting us into. Our text this morning is from John 20, verse 19 through 23. You can turn in your Bibles there now. And in the Bibles in front of you, it is on page 880. One. Brian Heasley was a typical rough and tumble kind of boy. He grew up in England with four brothers and parents who loved Jesus. He spent most of his summer days, as boys should, riding bikes, building forts, and playing football until his mom would call him in for tea and homemade cakes warm from the oven. Brian adored his mom. 
And his world was completely shaken when she suddenly passed away when he was just 11 years old. Having no idea how to deal with this tremendous grief, Brian found himself falling into wild behavior to try to numb his pain. He eventually got kicked out of school. He turned to drugs and alcohol to find some relief. And this substance abuse led to more destructive behavior. And at 19, he found himself alone with his grief as he sat out his jail sentence for armed robbery. I want to pause that story here. Don't worry, we'll come back to it in a few minutes. But before we do, I want to look with you at John 20, starting with verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. As I was reading and researching and praying through this scripture passage over the last couple of weeks, there were three actions that Jesus takes in this passage that started to bubble up out of the story for me. And so as we look back at that text today, I would like to organize our time in these three movements. One, the resurrected Jesus comes. Two, the resurrected Jesus resurrects. And three, the resurrected Jesus sends. Together we will discover how Jesus comes to his disciples, how he meets them where they are and resurrects the dead things in their hearts, and then how he sends them and gives them the Holy Spirit to empower them to continue his work in the world. And we will see where we can find our place in this story. So let's begin with the first movement, the resurrected Jesus comes. If you look back at verse 19 of chapter 20, it starts with this. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. I want us to put ourselves in the disciples' shoes for a few minutes. It's the evening of the first Easter. And the disciples had just gone through an incredibly traumatic weekend. Over the last three years, they had spent them walking closely with their rabbi, Jesus. They left life as they knew it to be with him and to learn how to do life with him. They celebrated when he healed the blind and the lame. They hung on his every word as he taught. They laughed with him and they cried with him. Sometimes they didn't understand him, but they were compelled by his love and by the crazy upside-down kingdom he offered. They wanted to trust him as their Messiah, but at the same time, they hoped that maybe he would claim his earthly throne over Roman rule. They loved him. They wanted to be like him. He was their rabbi, their brother, and their friend. But then, just a few days before this story, in Jesus' biggest hour of need, most of the disciples had fled his side in fear or denied that they even knew Jesus. And then he went on to die a brutal, brutal death on the cross. So imagine their horror, confusion, shame, and grief that they must have been experiencing as he died. They had trusted him as their Messiah, but now he was dead, and they had fled. They had fled the scene. So they were ashamed, sad, and scared. It seemed that all was lost. And then they heard that Jesus' body can't be found, and some of them are saying that he's alive. Could this be possible? What will the Jewish leaders do to them if it is true? 
Would Jesus even want to take them back as his disciples after the cowardly way they had acted a few days earlier? It is in this chaos and mess of emotions that the resurrected Jesus comes. He comes to these disciples in a room with locked doors where they are hunkered down, terrified of what the leaders might do to them. The resurrected Jesus comes to them in all of their embarrassment, shame, fear, and grief. He supernaturally enters the room. The resurrected Jesus comes. The Bible says he stood among them. Imagine their shock and surprise when they looked up and through tears, they see the very man they were grieving standing among them. The resurrected Jesus comes. He came to the disciples And he comes to you and to me. He seeks us out. He runs after us. He comes to us in our darkest moments. In those seasons where all seems lost, where disillusionment and despair are threatening to pull us under, Jesus comes. The living, resurrected king comes. He comes to stand among us. He comes in our valleys and in our storms. All we need to do is open our tear-filled eyes to see him standing among us. The resurrected Jesus comes. And his presence is healing. The resurrected Jesus resurrects. The first words Jesus spoke to his disciples as he stood among them are recorded in the second half of verse 19. He comes and then he says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. This shalom is a common Jewish greeting, but the fact that Jesus says it twice in our short passage gives us reason to think that he really wanted to emphasize the peace he was offering here. And the disciples were no doubt feeling angst about whether or not Jesus was going to accept him, them after they had abandoned him. So Jesus' words of peace were a gift, like balm to their souls. The empty grave brought resurrection to the disciples and gave them the gift of eternal life with Jesus. But the resurrection doesn't just apply to them when they get to heaven Jesus was also resurrecting all that seemed dead in their relationship with him. Reflecting on this passage, theologian Frederick Dale Bruner says, It's not the resurrection as Christ's resumption of heavenly glory that needs to be emphasized here in this passage, but the resurrection as the renewal of personal relations with the disciples. Jesus' words brought healing to the disciples. Where they deserved a rebuke, they instead received grace. And Jesus doesn't offer these words of peace flippantly. The disciples stand there terrified with the chaos and the hatred of life. But Jesus comes to them, having endured this same chaos and hatred to the fullest extent on the cross, and then conquering it. The resurrected Jesus comes and he resurrects and this resurrection brings personal relational healing to the disciples hearts Jesus resurrects the disciples doubts also by giving them physical proof of his resurrection that had just happened in John 20 verse 20 it says he showed them his hands and his side Jesus cared enough to give them exactly what they needed, emotional restoration and physical proof of the resurrection. Jesus is resurrecting the disciples, which secures their hope in the gospel forever. The comfort Jesus gives them is contagious. This healing of their souls will compel them to share this hope with the world. In 2 Corinthians 1, Verse 3 through 5, it says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father who shows us loving kindness and our God who gives us comfort. He gives us comfort in all our troubles. We give the same kind of comfort God gives. 
As we have suffered much for Christ and have shared in his pain, we also share in his great comfort. The disciples will be able to minister out of the healing and comfort they themselves have received. And then the text says they were, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Jesus' presence and Jesus' restoration of their souls brings joy. And Jesus predicted this joy earlier in John's gospel. In John 16, verse 20, Jesus is talking to his disciples about his death and resurrection. And this is what he says. Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. No one will take away your joy. Jesus came to them in fear and grief. His presence brought them peace because he applied the resurrection to the deepest parts of the disciples' souls. The resurrection is good news for their eternity, but it's also good news for their current realities. It was through this restoration, through this resurrection work that the disciples' eyes were opened to recognize Jesus and joy, overwhelming joy is a result of Jesus' healing work in their hearts. Joy is a side effect of being with Jesus. It's interesting to note that Jesus' body was raised and healed here post-resurrection, but his body still bore the scars, he showed them, still bore the scars of his healing. It's as if those scars announced to the world that God had done a powerful work. Because of the resurrection, Jesus' deepest suffering became his greatest gift to the world. And because of the resurrection taking place in their hearts, the disciples could join with the psalmist in saying, God, you have turned my mourning into dancing. Jesus brings life back into the parts of us that are dead and need resurrecting. Abraham Kuyper says, I know you've heard this quote here before, but it's so good I wanted to share it again. He says, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Where does God this morning want to cry, mine, in your life? Jesus wants to resurrect your fear and your pain and the hidden places of sin and turn them into something beautiful. Could your darkest hours become the places that most testify to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ? Could your scars become a beautiful gift to the world? What square inch of your soul do you need Christ to resurrect this morning? The resurrected Jesus comes, the resurrected Jesus resurrects, and then the resurrected Jesus sends. In John 20, verse 21, Jesus says, peace be with you. It's the second time he said that, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus makes it clear, abundantly clear, that sin and brokenness do not sideline the disciples. Jesus doesn't discount them for abandoning him. Instead, he restores them to himself. His power is made perfect in their weakness. And he sends them to join in his resurrection work. The disciples are not receiving a new commission here. They're taking on the very commission that Jesus received from the Father. 
Just as Jesus was God's representation in the world, now his followers will represent him in the world. And because we can read the Bible and we can look back in history, we know the rest of the story. We know the disciples accepted this commission, which is wild. Just a few moments earlier, they were huddled in shame and fear, and now they're saying yes to Jesus. They're saying yes, accepting his commission to go and boldly share all that they've experienced and witnessed. witnessed. They go on to spread the gospel through the entire world. This encounter that they had with Jesus, this encounter that we just read about must have been so meaningful, so powerful, and so healing that it compelled them to preach the gospel with everything they had for the rest of their lives. Some of them even were killed for living out this commission. An encounter with the living God. An encounter with the resurrected Jesus. An encounter with the healing, transforming, and resurrecting power of Jesus changed everything for them, and it can change everything for us. But they couldn't have accepted this commission on their own. Not out of their own strength. And in John 20, verse 22, it says, And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Our first introduction of Jesus in the Gospel of John came from the prophetic words of John the Baptist in John 1, where he calls Jesus, John the Baptist calls Jesus, the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. The one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So in John 20, Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy. He baptizes his disciples with the Holy Spirit to empower them to go and fulfill their commission. And this image of Jesus being empowered by the Holy Spirit is all throughout John's gospel. Jesus is known as the one whom God has given the Spirit without measure. The Spirit flows through him like a living spring, a source of life, refreshment, and renewal. John 7 verse 38 says, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Reminds me of our stage back here. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in were later to receive. So John 20, verse 22, what we just read in this passage today, when Jesus breathes on his disciples and gives them the Holy Spirit, it's the fulfillment of scripture. And it's the climax of Jesus, or of John's entire gospel. The Holy Spirit was experienced and talked about through Jesus' entire ministry. Jesus taught that the Holy Spirit would be even better than his own physical presence with them. John 14, 15, 16 are full of incredible teaching about the Holy Spirit. I don't have time to unpack today, but go and read them. So much neat stuff in there about the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit was the essential message in Jesus' final lecture to his disciples. The Holy Spirit was promised in the upper room and symbolized at the cross when water literally flowed from Jesus' body. And now the Spirit is being given to the disciples in a very personal way. Jesus breathes on them. He breathes on them and pours out the Spirit on them in his breath. This outpouring of the Spirit brings us back to the creation story. Where in Genesis 2, it says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Jesus breathing on his disciples also reminds us of a vision the prophet Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 37. In this vision, God led him to a valley where there was dry and dead bones lying on the floor of the valley. And in verse 6 of Ezekiel 37, God says to the bones, I will put 
breath in you. And you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. And he breathed on the bones and they came to life. God breathed into Adam the breath of life. He breathed the dry bones back to life in Ezekiel's vision. And now Jesus breathes on his disciples to create new life again. To give them new life, to welcome them into the start of the new creation. The mission Jesus gave his disciples, gave his disciples is only possible by the Holy Spirit who represents the continuous healing presence of the risen Christ. And this is true for us today as well. The Holy Spirit then is the very breath of God. The Holy Spirit is Christ's provision to the church. The Spirit is necessary for the work of the church in the world. People alone cannot bring the dead to life. We need the Spirit to breathe life into what is dead to bring people into Christ's new creation. And we need the Spirit to resurrect all that is dead in our hearts for the sake of the world. For the sake of the world. I've had some headaches and a sore back. I guess that's what, you know, when, once you turn 40, those kinds of things start happening. Um, and so I've been working with a physical therapist to try to restore my body back to full health. I went in expecting to be given a strict set of exercises to strengthen different muscles, and I did eventually receive some of that. But at first, the exercises the physical therapist gave me were breathing exercises. I was confused by this until he taught me how vital it is to breathe deeply, to get oxygen into all the places in my body that need it. He told me that the body will always prioritize oxygen flow, and as a result, sometimes the wrong muscles kick in and work overtime, causing tension and pain. So learning how to breathe in such a way that my lungs could fully expand with air in the way they were created was vital to my healing. Isn't that similar to our spiritual lives? Jesus rose from the dead he conquered sin and death in an instant so we could have life for all eternity with Jesus. Praise God for this truth. But we still need the breath of God to flow through every nook and cranny of our souls. Our souls can't function well without this. We need the spirit, the breath of God to heal, to redeem, to restore, and to resurrect. We need the Spirit to continually apply the cross and the empty grave to anything that is dead and broken within us. Jesus comes with resurrection power to bring life back into the parts of us that are dead and need resurrecting. And as we read in Revelation 21, he is making all things new. The resurrected Jesus comes, he resurrects, and then he sends. Where is Jesus sending you? I don't necessarily mean physically sending you, but where in your life is he asking you to testify to your resurrection? Where in your life is he calling you to relinquish what is dead and to live resurrected? Where is he calling you to live resurrected? To be a person of the resurrection. What if the weakest parts of your story, the parts you want to keep hidden, the parts you are embarrassed and ashamed about, the broken parts, the sinful parts, the painful parts, what if those are the very places Jesus wants to apply the resurrection? What if he wants to declare in those places, mine, mine? What if he wants to draw you close to him and heal and redeem and restore? What if those places are the places he wants his power to be made perfect in your weakness for his glory?
back to the story about Brian. While Brian was contemplating his life in jail, a hunger for God's word was stirred in him. I believe that's the Spirit's work. He began to devour the Bible, and over the next couple of years, little by little, Jesus got a hold of his heart. There were many wounds to be healed, but Jesus came to him, and his presence was a balm for Brian's hurting, weary soul. And after Brian was released from jail, he found a small church community that accepted him as he was and loved him unconditionally. And slowly, Jesus began to resurrect the dead parts of Brian's heart and put Brian's life back together. His childhood faith came alive. He met and married Tracy, a beautiful girl who had a heart for Jesus. And as Jesus healed Brian's heart, he also sent him in big ways and small ways to live out the gospel and expand the kingdom. The Holy Spirit empowered Brian to become a pastor, a leader in the 24-7 global prayer movement, and a missionary to those who were very much like he was before Jesus did a healing work in his heart. Brian's darkest days and his weakest moments have been resurrected and are now being used to further Christ's kingdom. Brian is living resurrected. Where does Jesus want you to live resurrected? I see it happening here. I see so many of you living resurrected, living surrendered to the Spirit who is breathing new life in you and growing beauty from your ashes. I see you leading a grief share group to help others after losing someone you loved. I see you serving those with addiction after Jesus met you and healed you of your own addictions. I see you reaching out to someone who experienced a miscarriage because you know the pain of losing a baby. I see you encouraging your sister to be herself because God helped you grow through a time where you were picked on. I see you bringing a meal to someone who was going through cancer treatments because you lost your mom to cancer and you know the pain. I see you giving respite to parents who have a child who has special needs because you know firsthand what it's like to parent tricky kids. I see you welcoming someone who just moved here into your home because you know what it's like to start over in a new city. Where is God? Asking you to live resurrected. Friends, your brokenness doesn't sideline you in the kingdom of God. Your brokenness doesn't sideline you. The resurrected Jesus comes to you and to me. He invites us to draw close and surrender all the deepest, darkest parts of our souls so he can resurrect them, so he can breathe new life in us, so he can empower us with the Holy Spirit. God loves to create beauty from our ashes for the sake of the world. And this, friends, this is the power of the gospel. This is the power of the gospel. Let's be people who live resurrected. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We believe the Holy Spirit is a God who speaks all throughout the week. We believe he's been moving and speaking through um, life, congregational life updates and through scripture and through song and through message, but we also believe he's a God that comes in the quiet to speak directly to our souls, and we want to be a church that makes room for that. So in a minute, I'm going to say, come Holy Spirit, come, and we're just going to listen and see if he might have something he wants to speak to our hearts this morning. And as you listen, if you feel him nudging you, I just encourage you to respond how you see fit. 
And there's lots of ways you could do that. There's prayer cards in the rows in front of you. Feel free to jot something down and stick it in your Bible. You can continue to pray on your own. There will be some members of the prayer team with name tags standing around the back of the sanctuary. Feel free to go and pray with them. If you feel like you have a word for somebody else in the congregation, Pastor Matthew will be standing back by the tech booth to receive that word. And then we'll continue to respond through song in a little bit. But we serve a living and holy and resurrected God who wants to speak to us and what a, what a joy and a privilege it is to be in his presence. So we say, come, Holy Spirit. And God, I wonder where in our life you want us to live into the resurrection? Where in our life do you want to meet us this morning? What do we need you to resurrect? Come Holy Spirit.
extend a couple of invitations. It's my sense that there are some um, for whom the reality that Jesus continues to resurrect um, is one that really struck you this morning. And the reality that there is nothing out of God's reach to redeem, to restore, and to resurrect, including like dead things. It's kind of what this whole resurrection business is. And the second is that if there was a um, person or a place or a thing that you felt God was sending you this week, um, then we, we would love to, to pray with you for those things. Uh, it's my expectation that there's going to be a lot of people who come forward for prayer this morning. Because as God has breathed on us, as the Spirit has been present among us, it's not just for sen our sensation, it's not just for warm and fuzzy feelings, but it is for mission. It is for sending. And so if there's something that you feel com uh, compelled and called to this week, um, come forward. We want to commission you with prayer. But we all will go out. Jesus sends all of us to be radiant reflections of his love. And so I invite you now to extend your hands, to be in a posture of receptivity. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go now. Reflect the love of Jesus in the world. Amen.